and carries away a little grain of sand. So you don't really notice what's going on until almost it's too late. And they've been at it for a long time. And they keep a very low profile. They don't call attention to themselves. And during the Cold War, we called it the salami game, where you slice off a slice of salami and it gets imperceptibly smaller. But the Chinese even made a better art out of it. And they, 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 they don't attract attention when they're doing it until, yes, wow, they have an F-22 equivalent, okay, the J-20, and Secretary Gates was there when they flew it, and wow, it attracted a lot of attention. And maybe it's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back and finally awakens America. Dr. Smith, do you have anything, uh, any uh, views on that? Well, I think, I think we also, you know, we'll talk a little bit more later about how uh, as we are admitting more and more Chinese students, uh, particularly into the graduate programs in engineering and, and other scientific fields, that we're also limiting the opportunities for our own students. The university testified recently that the grade point average in order to get into the graduate program in engineering at the University of Michigan has gone up from a B minus to a B plus. Well, that means that if you're a Michigan student that has a B average, you no longer have the opportunity to get a PhD in engineering from the University of Michigan. And the person that takes your place is probably going to be Chinese. Got it. Well, um, I, uh, I think that uh, may be a little bit time to take a little break here for a second. And um, we will uh, uh, come right back. Thank you very much. The Center for Judicial Accountability is on a mission to improve the quality of our judiciary. This is an organization dedicated to removing political consideration from the judicial selection process and ensuring that corrupt judges are properly disciplined and removed. Why shouldn't judges like everyone else be responsible for their incompetence and deliberate misdeeds? Why should judges be allowed to run their courtrooms as their own private fiefdom, free to abuse litigants and lawyers who come before them? We are building a national organization focused on the problem of bad judges, judges who are incompetent, abusive, and dishonest. By dishonesty, we mean judges who knowingly disregard clear and controlling law and who write decisions which fabricate or deliberately omit critical facts. These judges destroy people's lives, families, and businesses, and for ulterior reasons, torpedo important cases affecting the public. The financial cost of appealing a judge's bad decision puts appeal out of reach for the average citizen. Yet those who make the financial sacrifice and do appeal often meet with the same realities on the appellate court level as in the lower court. Even where appellate courts reverse the lower court's blatantly erroneous decision, there is no personal cost to the judge for his judicial malpractice, but only to the litigants who have been wronged and to the system. Incompetent, abusive, and corrupt judges create havoc at the trial level and overwhelm the system with otherwise needless appeals. This puts the courts in crisis and is extremely costly to taxpayers. Obviously, improving the way we choose judges is critical, whether by election or appointment. There must be safeguards to ensure that only persons of the highest competence, integrity, and judicial temperament become our judges. The Center for Judicial Accountability is one of those ways. Grand juries may be another. Welcome back to Power Corrupts Again. I'm David Scheid, here with Dr. Bill Kaufman and Dr. Doug Smith, both retired University of Michigan professors. In continuing my background on my guest, Dr. Douglas Smith is a former professor of pathology at the University of Michigan. 
He received his MD degree from the University of Iowa and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. He has spent his career providing laboratory and research support for some of the leading transplant plant programs in the country at the University of Nebraska, the University of Oklahoma, Baylor University Medical Center, and the University of Michigan. In his retirement, Dr. Smith has joined Dr. Kaufman in investigating issues of technology loss to China and the corruption of university governance that promotes the loss of our technological advances so important to our economic and national security interests. In the first segment, Dr. Kaufman provided us with a brief history of ties between the University of Michigan and China. He underscored the fact that though the education of Chinese nationals had begun as a humanitarian effort to help lift the Chinese out of a depressed state after their cultural revolution. About the time of Jimmy Carter's presidential administration, since the early 1980s, the result has been a self-serving sellout of secret industrial technology and American jobs by the university president and administrative board of regents at University of Michigan. For the last 10 years, Dr. Kaufman has been speaking out through the proper university grievance channels about the university profiting like a private corporation from federally funded research. He was also concerned that he saw the university's engineering department freely providing China with dual-use technology that could be developed by China towards the industrialization of smart weapons, long-range weapons, and weapons of mass destruction. What Dr. Kaufman clearly found was that the University of Michigan President Mary Sue Coleman was initiating a program of patenting the results of taxpayer-funded research and using those industrial patents on dual-use technology to help create startup companies in China. See, the way it works is that dual-use technology can serve two purposes, one good, one bad, like nuclear energy. We might use it to light up a city or to blow it up. What Dr. Kaufman recognized a long time ago was that the University of Michigan, indeed acting like a greedy private corporation, was nurturing ties with China to establish profitable business ventures in that country while disregarding the significance of China's long-term history of human civil rights offenses and the fact that China was requiring that these American institutions provide their Chinese partners with equal access to the dual-use technology as a condition to setting up business ventures in that country. Yet Dr. Kaufman's patriotic concerns about our national security and the security of our international allies in places like India, South Korea, and Japan have been persistently rejected and covered up by university administrators. At first, the university tried to bribe Dr. Kaufman into joining the unethical sellout of American security interests. And when that did not work, the administration began a slow and methodological campaign to shut him up, to deprive him of his teaching status, and to eventually force him out of his employment at the university. During the 2004-2005 academic year, Dr. Kaufman had reinstituted a two-semester course concerning explosions, explosives, propellants, and pyrotechnics at the request of the students, and as a result of the beginning of the Iraq War. He was basically teaching American students what they need to know to survive an overseas war. However, once the University of Michigan administration appointed a Chinese immigrant, Wei Shi, as head of the engineering program, Dr. Kaufman's program was instantly shut down. After spending a full 30 years of gaining information about America's secret research and dual-use technology here in America, Wei Shi went back to China. More recently, and for most of the past five years, Dr. Kaufman has been actively engaged in a national security effort, trying to further prevent foreign students and scholars from looting America's important industrial and military information. My bringing Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Smith to this program is my effort to help him to get the word out to Americans that we too should be concerned. So Dr. Kaufman, tell us more about what's at stake here. Well, when you have a sleeper agent like Wei Shi, who's been over here for 30 years, and he's 
technically interested in aerodynamics. He's able to collect a lot of things that be, would be useful with regard to the creation of a Chinese stealth fighter. And then you have, okay, the whole Board of Regents in Mary Sue ignoring what's going on around them. And Doug and I appeared before the Board of Regents and told them, you know, we are creating a problem for us. We're a Frankenstein monster mm. that we're going to have to deal with. And this is really not new information. There's a lot of information out there from the past, from 10 years ago, from 15 years ago, saying that the Chinese are going to do exactly what we see them doing now, what we recognize doing them. Uh, a, a very significant item is, is the Cox Report. In 1998, a congressman from California, Christopher Cox, established a commission. And they looked at the theft of our technology by the Chinese. And perhaps the highlight of that whole thing is that the Chinese have stolen every major nuclear and thermonuclear warhead that we have from Los Alamos. Most people recognize mm. the name of Wen Ho Lee, the W-88 warhead, which is on the Trident missile. And Cox says, look, they stole it. Of course, the Department of Justice blew the prosecution of this guy. Well, there, there's other sources. There's the U.S.-China Commission, which, which has written up on an annual basis the report to Congress that the Chinese are stealing. You, you have the Department of Defense putting out its annual report like it used to do for the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. saying the Chinese is an increasing military threat. We have bulletins from major FBI field offices saying, well, we just caught this guy spying at, at General Motors, we just caught this guy spying at Monsanto. So mm -hmm. we are naive and we don't believe what authoritative sources are telling us about the theft of our technology. I mean, it's, it's not that Doug and I have made up this big story like, hey, the Chinese are a threat. I mean, you have the retired head of the Ann Arbor FBI office, Greg Schedel, standing before Burton Bell Tower, being filmed by Vince Wade, saying that these Chinese are here for one purpose, to steal what we have. So we should pay attention to what we're told. We can no longer continue to ignore it. Uh, maybe the situation has gotten so bad that we are going to have to address this issue. Mm. Doug, maybe you have a few comments to add. Yeah, last summer, uh, President Coleman went to China and signed new agreements with Shanghai Zhao Tong University to uh, enter into joint collaborative research projects, particularly in areas of green technology, medical technology, uh, and other things of very important economic uh, value. Uh, and But they wrote the the agreements so that any time there is an invention, then the, uh, you have a committee of four uh, people from the Chinese University, four from the University of Michigan, who will decide who's the lead party for that invention. And whoever the lead party is gets to decide which company is going to develop that new invention. So you can imagine that if the University of Michigan is looking out for its own interests and not necessarily that of America, that the Chinese, if you have a new, say, lithium battery technology, might say, well, gee, if you, if you let us be the lead party, then we'll give you a higher percentage of the royalties, and it'll be a Chinese company which will be up and running and having profits much quicker than if you let it go through an American company. And, uh, and so therefore, the, the, the University of Michigan may allow them to be a lead party on something that they didn't invent. And so this is the way in which, you know, there's nobody in that room that's looking out for the interests of America as opposed to simply the interests of the University of Michigan. Well, and I uh, also realize that by having 2,500 students over here that foreign students pay a lot more uh, than, than American students or Michigan students uh, at that university. So well, they can make money on both ends. Right. And you ha so you have to look at some of the motivation for, you know, why does the University of Michigan value all these ties to China? And, you know, one of them is that they get paid a lot of out-of-state tuition. Um, we, we also think that, uh, that there are uh, economic you know, investment kinds of reasons. Uh, it's our understanding that the university has about a hundred million dollars worth of the um, university's endowment invested in Chinese startup companies. So, so that uh, you know, inside information about where to invest, you know, would be very valuable to uh, the university endowment. Uh, but also, we don't know anything about where the personal investments of the China, of the the university's leadership are, and they may be making profits as well. Well, and I'm sure the Chinese are offering a lot more perks than that. 
Well, when you look at the makeup of the Board of Regents, seven of the eight are attorneys. Mm 